They say they're my bank. They've confirmed my postcode and my account number. They say they've spotted suspicious activity on my account. They could be my bank. Now they've asked me to move my money to a safe account they've set up. That tells me they are not my bank. My money? My info? I don't think so. A genuine bank will never contact you asking you to move your money to a safe account. Take five. A much bigger to-do moving into actual legislation has been made in the past few weeks over the drinking habits of minors, minors being defined differently by different states. For the first time since Prohibition, the federal government is about to do something about drinking. Since Prohibition was repealed in 1934, it has been left to each of the states to set its own policy about the sale and manufacture of alcohol. You must remember that though prohibition was repealed by a constitutional amendment, many states maintained it until fairly recently. I recall some years ago the outrage of the late Randolph Churchill taking a train from New Orleans across the continent on his way for some big reporting assignment in San Francisco. The train slid out of New Orleans and crossed the bayous of Louisiana all through the afternoon. It crossed over into Texas as the sun's shadows were beginning to lengthen. And an hour or two later, across the eastern plain, the twilight fell. And at that latitude, twilight is more of a poetic idea than a fact. It falls very fast. And no reporter I ever knew was quicker than Randolph to get the message so movingly expressed by E.B. White, the most beautiful sound at twilight is the tinkle of ice. The rubicund and impressive Briton heard the distant echo in the club car, or thought he did, and he lumbered off there, plumped down, and commanded a double whiskey. In those days, they still had Pullman porters, and the amiable black man already got up in his blazing white jacket to begin laying the tables for dinner. He looked at Mr. Churchill as if he were demented. Why, bless you, sir, he said, ain't no liquor of any sort allowed till we cross the New Mexico line. This is Texas. Randolph, as was his wont, bawled out the amiable waiter, and demanded to know when the line would be crossed. The man took out a fob watch, and he said, Well, now, I should reckon it will be around four o'clock in the morning. Mr. Churchill was purple with disgust, first to discover that Texas is 800 miles wide, and the Texans, of all legendary hellions, should still deny themselves the comforts of alcohol. However, while there are still counties in the United States that sell no alcohol, there is no state that maintains the prohibition law. The states vary greatly in their laws that set a minimum age for the purchase of alcoholic beverages. In 23 states, the age is 21. Elsewhere, in the other 27 states, it varies between 20 and 17 in only one state, Arizona. There are six states that permit the sale at 18, and I doubt that the most knowing student of American manners and mores could correctly call them off. New York and Hawaii, the Big Apple and the Big Pineapple, are not surprising. Or Louisiana, cradle of jazz and lover of bourbon. But how about the austere Scandinavians of Wisconsin? the border state of West Virginia. How about the dour, law-abiding Yankees of Vermont? It is 18 in all of them. Well, now, President Reagan, of all anti-federalists, who does share Jefferson's strong belief in as little national government as possible, Mr. Reagan has done a flip-flop. He wants a national law raising the drinking age to 21 in order to reduce the driving accidents caused by alcohol. 
The new and shocking fact is that of all accidents due to drunk driving, 42% involve adults between the ages of 16 and 24, though they are only one-fifth of all licensed drivers. The House has already passed such a bill, and it's now before the Senate. Apart from the moral question or the safety principle, the inducement that the bill offers to have the states fall into line is the threat of withholding from them government funds that go to maintain the federal highways that run through their states. This is a very big stick. So far, the debate has been short and sharp, and the bill seems hell-bent for passage. While very few voices are heard suggesting that compulsory seat belts reduce accidents more drastically, or that, as we discovered during Prohibition, once the apple is forbidden, many more young people yearn for it, who never cared for it much in the first place. That was an archive edition of Letter from America by Alistair Cook. You can listen to thousands more programmes on the BBC Radio 4 website.